All right, so this is Movie Macro number three. We're testing out a new mic setup. We're testing out a new camera lens, so I should be looking extra crisp. Keith is looking extra crispy, right? <laughs> um, and we're going to be covering today a Fish Tank by uh, Andrea Arnold. Is that? Well, yeah. Andrea Arnold. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. British. Yeah, Andrea Arnold. Um, it's an interesting film, but before we get to the film itself, uh, first, automachination.com, uh, patreon.com slash automachination. If you want to get a bonus conversation with me and Keith, we're going to be talking about, I just put up a, a, a new video on Jordan Peterson, and um, I, I find the kind of a clientele, let's call it, that visits these videos to be very interesting, right? And I, I, and I want to see the relationship between the person Peterson and the kind of commentators that I get. So we're going to discuss some of that kind of, I don't know, uh, infantile symbiosis that we got going on between those two. Um, we're going to talk about climate crisis. We're going to talk about uh, Keith's recent move to New York City, um, what he notices, you know, living here compared to anybody else. And maybe contrast that against some of my own experiences growing up. Um, living in a place for a long time, it's sometimes hard to tell exactly what's changing, what, what's staying the same. So uh, that, that would make for an interesting conversation, plus a bunch of other stuff as well. But we're gonna, we're gonna start with Fish Tank here. So it's a 2009 film. I actually, uh, Keith was the one that told me, hey, I, I saw this film a few weeks ago. It was really uh, excellent. Um, and when he told me the name, I was kind of surprised because the first time that I heard about this movie, uh, it was actually around the time of release and I just saw the trailer and immediately it just kind of turned me off a little bit, uh, simply because it had a lot of that aesthetic that, um, what's his name, David Gordon Green, who, who did George Washington. He also did another film called All the Real Girls. And like, if you, you, if you look at trailers for something like All the Real Girls or Fish Tank, it, it, it sounds like it might be one of those films that are based on, you know, like uh, like image juxtapositions that don't really go anywhere. Character sketches don't don't really go anywhere. But th that's in fact not the case. So I was very uh, pleasantly surprised. I also realized that a movie that we maybe would have seen a, a few months back it was a documentary called Cow. So she's the same director uh, of that film, and now it makes me want to seek it out after watching this one. Uh -huh. um, but okay, so I've been talking a little too much. Why don't Why don't you just take it away with the film itself yeah yeah so this movie fish tank uh as he said it came out in 2009 it is a british movie i think maybe even a like a like a government financed one because that the at the beginning of the movie it says due to like a national lottery grant or something like that that it so uh, they got more funding for the arts over there, although, you know, that's a that's a mixed bag, as everybody knows, public funding of the arts. But this, I, I mean, I guess you could just sort of generically call it like, you know, a realist or a neorealist piece. You know, it takes place in, I don't know if, I unfortunately, I don't know my, my British geography well enough to know, but I know on, on the Wikipedia, it says it takes place in like East London and like council housing estates uh, of that area. So it follows kind of the uh, the the lower socioeconomic strata of the outskirts of of London or the nearby suburbs. Uh, put it that way. Um, it was the breakout movie of Michael Fassbender, who went on to do. Although I, I, he was actually in Hunger before this, but I don't think that was a big movie at the time of release. I think this is the one that kind of, or was the X-Men movie before this? I can't remember. I think that came out around the same time as this one because that's how he get, that's how he got big commercial success. But I think this was the first movie that he got real notice for as like a dramatic actor, even though Hunger came out before this and is the superior movie and the superior performance, but uh, this this one got a little more notice at the time. Uh, it also stars what and really stars what's the name of the the lead actress in the movie? Katie Jarvis. Yeah, Katie Jarvis. Uh, very excellent performance by a teenage actress or maybe early 20s i don't know what she actually was but she's playing a 15 year old character so you know somewhere in that probably like 18 to 21 range at the time that the movie was made would be my guess um the the basic premise of the movie is that it follows uh, a young girl 15 years old named mia 
Mia Williams, I think. Is that the the last? That's the last name it said on Wikipedia. I can't remember if they actually said it in the movie. They, they think they said the mom's last name, and it was Williams. Uh, and she is a young, like high school aged. I don't think they call it that there, but a uh, young high school aged girl who has pretty bad like temper and self control problems. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, we see her uh, exiting uh, a council housing building uh, in the area where she lives, and she basically goes and, and picks a fight and severely bloodies the nose of a young girl that, she, as she's watching them dance, and when you see the close-ups on her, you could tell that on some level she kind of wishes she could be a part of their little, like, group and part of like the social aspect of the dancing but the second that they in any way like acknowledge her she immediately turns hostile and she attacks one of them with a headbutt that severely bloodies their nose so that kind of gives the flavor of the movie in a nutshell at the beginning and it's it's not really a movie with a super strong plot it basically just follows what i think is like a, a couple weeks maybe in her life maybe a month or so if that uh, where her her mom, who is kind of um, an underachiever, uh, partier, uh, doesn't particularly seem to like being a mom or have any real idea how to do it, um, uh, meets a new boyfriend named Connor, who's played by Michael Fassbender. And she also meets another young man who's supposed to be about 19, who in the movie they call a... A pikey, which I believe is a like kind of a slur for travelers in England. I think travelers is kind of the the preferred nomenclature. Uh, and sort of con contrasting her experience with these two guys, with more of the focus on the relationship with Michael Fassbender as the older man dating her mom, who she's cl clearly attracted to, but also has a, a really strong reflexive hostility towards. As she has a reflexive hostility towards basically everybody, including her own family. Yeah, and, and I, I want to just dwell a little bit on uh, some of the early scenes. So, like, you know, it's one of those things where uh, M Maya or Mia, she's uh, she's a character that maybe for a lot of people would otherwise not be very relatable, right, given some of her behaviors, especially early on. But, um, you know, it, like in terms of the writing, like it was actually very well done uh, making not only making her relatable, but just kind of uh, giving her uh, positive qualities, right, amidst uh, many of the negatives. So, for example, like when when everything starts, right. So she's either in kind of like a council house or maybe even like an abandoned house, right. There doesn't seem to be that much going on. It seems like some some kind of like empty room, right. Um, you know, like some of the buildings that I've seen with, uh, you know, like under construction or whatever it could be something like that. And in this kind of very neutral way, she's like she's dancing or like she's clearly practicing something, right? She's obviously not doing it for an audience other than some audience in her own head. Uh, this isn't uh, this isn't necessarily like celebrated in the film, right? Uh, but it's presented in a kind of neutral way, and in neutral fashion, like it's clear that she's kind of like working on some kind of skill, right? You could have an opinion as to whether or not it's worthwhile whether or not um, you know, she has any skills in that regard, but she's clearly working some kind of craft, right? Which, which uh, m gives her a sort of like interesting start. Immediately after she, uh, I, I forget whether she takes a phone call or she listens to a voicemail or she leaves a voicemail. Um, yeah, she, she leaves a voicemail where, you know, it's like one of those things where she's like, oh, you know, like uh, I, I apologize, like there's some kind of fight with her friend. Uh, I apologize, you, you bitch, you kind of like something like that, like a, almost like a term of affection. You know the way that I am, right? So uh, immediately this kind of like feeling of, um, you know, she's young, right? She looks like a teenager, but she is kind of, you know, maybe reflective on herself. She has like uh, some sort of desire, whether it's uh, uh, honest or maybe not so honest to make some kind of amends. And later on, when she even goes and she has that fight with those uh, other girls that are doing the same thing, essentially, you know, dancing and practicing, although they're doing it, you know, in a crowd, maybe a little bit for an audience, not just some sort of abstraction in, in their heads. Um, she, start, she starts off the fight by essentially saying that their dancing sucks, 
right? Mm-hmm. So it, it reminds me a lot of like, you know, just the kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it reminds me a lot of like the kind of stuff you would see just kind of, you know, growing up in New York City. And this is like London. And this is kind of like an outer part of uh, London, right? Just like uh, I was growing up with kind of like outer parts of uh, New York City. And you have the same kind of dynamic going on, right? Whether it's like, you know, people into rap, right? You, you know, they would easily tell each other, you know, like you have no skills, you suck, blah, 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 right? Um, so, and the fact that, you know, both these cases, it's kind of like hip hop that's making, uh, th- that, that allows that to kind of be at the fore, this idea that even if you have nothing, maybe you have something like this to work for, right? Work towards, right? This has been my experience, you know, just being around rap since I was very young. Um, and, and it's interesting to see it play out uh, in this fashion too. And you, you see a lot of stuff happening, like in the, uh, um, like just the fact that uh, th- there are some moments where I, I think the music is not necessarily that well chosen. Like you know, it's a little bit hokey near the end to use Nas's uh, "Life's a Bitch" to sort of like play out the kind of like ending of the film. Mm-hmm. Given everything that transpires, it's kind of like too on the nose. But very often, what happens is like. The, like w- when it, when it's like kind of like her scenes and there's music playing, she's often practicing to like very late '80s and very early '90s rap, where it's 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 almost in this kind of like pure state, like if you know what I mean, where um, uh, it's 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 yet to get to the point of like the highly complex stuff that maybe starts happening in the '90s or or the 2000s or whatever, but there's this kind of like emphasis on you know maybe like raw lyricism raw kind of rhythms uh the the kind of uh, dancing that comes along with it i think uh, is very conducive to that um so very often like the, the music is well chosen and they're, they're usually not songs that are really all that well known there's like you know late you know like early 90s uh rakim songs which you know most people that are into even like you know like rap they, they probably don't listen that far back really um, and you don't really see that being played, you know, too often uh, uh, these days or like people just kind of like forget about a lot of stuff or a lot of early stuff. And, um, you know, it, it was an interesting set of uh, choices uh, in that regard. But kind of like from the beginning, you see that this is going to be uh, whoever else comes in, even if there's like these sort of like adult situations or whatever. It's really going to be about Maya and her personal development. Right. It, it really is a story that is. You know, from from the perspective uh, of a kid, right? The way that a kid might understand some of this phenomena, the way that a kid might respond to some of the things that, that happen, right? It's really, it's really hers, right? Um, and I mentioned David Gordon Green early on, right? Just like with uh, George Washington, right? It's it's kind of like from uh, f- from a, a, a kid's perspective that is almost, in some senses, it's kind of idealized. Here, the idealization is more so. Maybe in what she feels about this, uh, um, you know, Michael Fassbender character, right? Uh, the, the the fact that for like a, a brief, you know, second she feels almost as if, right, there might be some kind of relationship or, or, or something happening like that. Or she feels like maybe she, you know, she gets this audition later on in the film and she's able to escape her, her circumstances, right? Um, but in both cases, right, there's this kind of like... Uh, you know, a uh, weird sort of nostalgia idealization going on, but very much still, we're talking about character driven uh, narratives. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, the, it's interesting how dance is like the, the sort of artistic vehicle of escape for a lot of these people here, you know, even the, the, the mom seems to have kind of an affection for dancing. I mean, she's shown dancing multiple times in the movie whether it's at the at the end kind of sadly to a to the Nas song which was a little bit weak as a as a denouement for the family uh, storyline or dancing at a party with Michael Fassbender you see the young girls dancing kind of in this just like vacant lot being uh, leered at by a bunch of you know teen guys and you see me uh, Mia dancing quite a bit and then there's also some exotic dancing uh featured mildly uh in the film as well uh which we 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 can expound more on a a little bit later but you know it kind of makes sense because that's probably you know like you don't see a lot of high culture in this place you know like it seems like television is kind of the 
uh, medium of cultural engagement of like most of the people in this community. You know, you don't exactly see like music venues in the background. You don't even really see like movie theaters. It's clearly a pretty poor area. You know, there's a lot of uh, vacant and abandoned lots and like, you know, decaying buildings in the background, like empty fields with nothing in them, but like a couple of trailers and things like that. So, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it sort of makes sense that like the, that the, the dancing, like the, you know, like music videos or, or things that they might have seen on television like that are kind of what they imagine as like their, their escape from this life. It's a, it's a nicely observed detail more than anything. I wouldn't say it has like intrinsically a depth, but it's, it, it, it has a way of kind of putting you in these people's headspace, you know, like to the extent that there's like, uh, you know, I, I, I swear I read something that was describing this movie, like saying that the, the character is seeking transcendence or something like that. And I think that's really quite an overstatement. It's more like they're, they're seeking like even like just temporary escape from kind of their circumstances, you know? Uh, so the, the, the movie kind of plays out after the opening scenes, as Alex described, you know, she, uh, she leaves a voicemail. She goes and yells at the dad of her friend and calls him a cunt. Uh, she goes and she assaults one of the girls kind of, I mean, they, they were having some harsh words for her, but it was pretty unprovoked. And, you, you get the sense that she's been a problem a long time. You know, she walks into her house and her mom is immediately like, what did you do? Did you break that girl's nose? The police are looking for you. But, it, and, and her mom is quite harsh with her and, and a little bit physical. And you get the sense that she really just doesn't know what to do with her, but also that she probably did not try all that hard either. You know, there's a scene later in the movie where she comes in, she says, is there any dinner? And she says, oh, uh, it's a little bit late for that. This isn't a cafe, which, you know, is one thing if it's like you're trying to teach a lesson to a teenager about staying out too late, but it's another thing if it's just like you've kind of given up on this teenager and you're, you're not even really doing the most basic parenting acts anymore which is kind of how i interpreted that in that moment but you also see her sister as well who is probably like eight or nine i would say in the movie is that about her age but she maybe, a little bit younger, you know? maybe even younger than that but she uh also has a, a rather foul mouth you know uses a lot of swear words has kind of a reflexive hostility as well you know we see her interact with other people and she tends to uh jump right to insults or i mean that that is one an, another thing about the characters that is like kind of a likability is that there is kind of a creativity to the way that they like insult and demean one another you know it's like they don't have uh and maybe that's i i do think that's more common like to 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 british culture in general but i mean you also sense that like you know, since there's not a lot else going on, they have put some work into having kind of like a quick wit with one another when it comes to like put downs and one liners and comebacks and things like that. So, I mean, it does to the extent that there's uh, that there's a yearning for transcendence or whatever. It's just sort of like, you know, these these are people they have, you know, creative impulses that aren't really being fulfilled. And these are the ways that it comes out in this kind of like semi-impoverished situation you know i mean it's it's nice that there is kind of a contrast in the movie because mia is not like the poorest person in the town you know i mean there are travelers that live in in her area and i mean they live in trailers they they seem to have very very little to their name and they can't even buy you know grain in bulk to feed their horse which they they pass off as saying oh the horse is old but i mean it's pretty clear like they have an emotional attachment to it and they can't really take care of it. So they're just kind of, kind of watching it die basically is, is, is a little bit what, what I took away from that. But you also see that when Mia sees these travelers and sees this, you know, sickly starving horse, her immediate impulse is to go, is to, to break into this, uh, you know, vacant lot and try and free the horse. You know, like what she thinks she's going to do with it, what she thinks the horse is going to do after it's free. I mean, it's clear that she is a child in many ways and she has not thought this plan through. But there, you know, after we've seen her engage in violence against somebody, you know, we are 
shown that there is kind of some some good in her as well you know there's kind of an an impulse to do good but you know for whatever reason either because of the way that her mom is or where she grew up or whatever kind of the only strategy that she's ever really learned to relate to other people and pursue what she wants is just sort of reflexively reflexively jumping to anger and 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 hostility and like verbal barbs you know so the the the, the movie does a nice job of kind of I don't want to say subtly because I wouldn't necessarily call it a subtle movie, but like gradually unveiling kind of this girl's world and setting the stage for her eventually leaving it at the end of the movie, which, which I think that part makes sense. It's mainly the, the scene with her dancing with the mom that I think is kind of too, too trite, too, too treacly, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, when we say travelers, uh, just in case people aren't aware, we're talking about the uh, Romani group in Britain. I guess specifically, uh, the the term that's used is travelers. Um, well, and- I, I think there's because there's non-Romani travelers because uh, I I've seen that this. I mean, gypsy is considered kind of a slur nowadays, but I, I know that I've seen a distinction made between like. Because I know there are Scottish and Irish travelers that are not really Romani or they've only somewhat mixed with Romani people. And I think travelers in England are kind of a mix of different ethnic groups. So that's why they kind of favor the umbrella term when they're trying to be nice and they call them pikeys when they're not trying to be nice. In in this case, uh, the the main one, Billy, he is uh, fairly a a dark skinned. Um, I'm guessing maybe he's supposed to be, you know, one of these uh, other ethnic groups. But yeah. any, but anyway, so yeah, what Keith sa- says about how so like directly after this fight, she runs and she sees his horse, and she immediately tries to f- free it. And and like Keith said, um, she doesn't really think this plan through, right? I mean, we we are talking about London essentially. What is a horse going to be doing wandering around? Right? Maybe eventually someone's going to pick it up, right? Maybe something else going to happen. Um, but it's just as kind of like the same sort of impulsive behavior that you see elsewhere it comes out here. Although, you know, there, the, the, you could argue that this is perhaps like a, a somewhat positive outlet, even if it is a bit thoughtless. Um, and, you know, uh, to some degree, I'd say maybe that's a little bit also a symbol that's uh, uh, too, mu- too, too, too like easy and too obvious on the nose. But, yeah. but, but at the same time, like w- when as the film goes on, I do find it interesting that instead of the the horse simply being this kind of a uh, uh, very predictable, like it, it starts off as a somewhat predictable symbol, but later on it becomes much more uh, of a kind of like fulcrum where, you know, it's just like another example of uh, like these like uh, ever shifting alliances, right? You see this between the family members, right? Sometimes they like each other, sometimes they don't. Right. Um, sometimes uh, she's uh, uh, going into this group of travelers and they attempt to like beat her and rape her. And sometimes she's starting, you know, a, a romance. Uh, sometimes she might be friendly with with her own friends. Right. Based on that voice message that she left. Other times, like there's other things going on, too. And I think this is a very uh, common thing that maybe is, is uh, easy to miss if you're not from some of these environments. Like a lot of these relationships are very kind of transactional right which makes them uh, pretty fragile once uh, whatever you know that transaction you know let's say it no longer is or it's no longer uh, usable or no longer useful um you know uh, and, and so like as the film goes on uh the horse is, is simply something that draws her to billy right one of the travelers uh and uh, it's it's something that takes on kind of like a, a life of its own, but it doesn't become this, you know, a symbol of something else. Like in, in some ways, it functions a little bit, you know, aesthetically uh, as an anti-symbol. I thought that was an interesting sort of inversion, a little bit given uh, the direction that it seemed to be going the first time that we see the horse. And even 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 if you take sort of the horse initially uh, as what it tries to be at face value at the very beginning. There's also this interesting quality where, like, I mean, like, first of all, it's a very well shot film. The details are very well chosen. And the fact that you see, like, a lot of kind of, um, you know, uh, like little touches and physical interactions between uh, Maya and the horse that make it just, like, a lot more real, right? That, that, that don't uh, allow it to simply be, like, in the realm of just, like, you know, symbol or abstraction. It, it's actually pretty real, right? And you, and you feel maybe what she feels, 
you see uh, what, what what she sees. Uh, there's like a, a, a naturalism uh, to to those touches and interactions that um, speaks to like a, what what goes on in, in the rest of the film. But uh, it, just treating, you know, I feel like you know, like treating the horses as as, as a symbol and what it is. It, it needs to be discussed. But reading some of the reviews and maybe some of the a little bit some of the more negative stuff um, that that you know makes fun of this thing as a symbol. Right there, there's actually I think more going on than than what meets the eye. Right, although I guess yes, initially the setup is a little bit trite. It's a little bit of a cliche, but again, I I, I would argue there's some interesting versions that that come along the way. Just kind of like its structural function um, in the film. Yeah, well, it's it's an example of how sometimes things that are like so, something can be both a good and a bad in a work of art, you know, like it can work from one angle and not so much from another, you know, I, the, the old sick horse as the symbol of like a young girl's yearning for something more or whatever. That's clearly trite. That's clearly cliche, but the horse as something that draws her to this young man that, you know, she otherwise probably would not have a lot of cause to have interaction with. And also the fact that, you know, there's no scene where the horse escapes. You know, there's no scene where the horse shows up at the river, like in that first movie we watched, Clara Sola. If you want to go back and watch that video, you know, there's no shot uh, of the horse racing off into the distance, like in, in Winter Sleep, the Nuri Bilga Jalan movie. Uh, it just kind of disappears from you know, from the movie. Either it was that that Billy says that it died, but it might have just been sold. You know, they might have. You know, they they are travelers, so they might have just traded it for something else uh, that somebody else had that they wanted. So I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know, there's there's a lot of possibilities there. So and, and also, I, I I do think on some level, like. It tells you something about uh, Billy and his brothers, you know, that like th that they can have additional reaction to Mia coming onto their private property and trying to free the horse that, you know, e you know, there there's hints of maybe just plain violence or maybe sexual violence, but that they can kind of keep this horse around and seem to have at least Billy seems to have some somewhat of like an emotional attachment to it or at least a sense that like he understands how the horse's condition looks and he at least has to make amends in her mind for how it's being treated. So, you know, it doesn't work so well as a, as, as a pure symbol of Mia's inner life or desire for blah, blah, blah. But it actually works pretty well as like, as a, as a, as a plot device and also as something that kind of just disappears halfway through the movie without really having like the cliche denouement that you might expect. Um, I, I would maybe, disagree somewhat with that the movie is a very well shot movie i would say it is well shot but not exceptionally well shot you know i mean there are some visuals of it that i remember uh the statutory rape scene or sex scene however you want to call it between michael fassbender and mia that happens uh later in the movie i don't want to jump ahead of ourselves in the discussion but i i did remember the visual because I, I actually just watched the movie for a second time today because i wanted to refresh myself since as alex said i i first watched this a few months ago uh and the, the visuals of that scene stuck out in my mind kind of the the orange lighting and some of the harsher shadows you know it almost gives it kind of like a like a dreamlike quality in that scene and in the sense like the this you can imagine that this is something that Mia maybe did fantasize about or daydream about prior to the moment, and it sort of captures that. And then Michael Fassbender sits up, and his eyes are kind of in shadow as he realizes, like, "Fuck, I, I, re I really probably should not have done that. Like, I, I, I'm kind of ashamed of myself that I let my inhibitions go that much. Although how how sincere he is in that feeling is certainly uh, open to debate. But that that scene stuck out. Um, the scene near nearer to the end where he chases her through a field and slaps her, uh, that scene stood out. But there's also a lot of uh, visuals in this movie that are kind of stuck in an older mode of cinematography that like mid to late 2000s, like, oh, I'm doing realism, so I'm going to shake the camera a lot. You know, some, some of the cuts, I'd say, are, are pretty quick in the movie compared to you know, what they could be. I mean, I, I mean, you watch something like, 
like you know a, a, a realistic depiction of poverty like uh, like the bicycle thief and and that one has pretty classical cinematography in some ways but you know pretty you know plain cinematography in other ways but I I, I will say that it it, it the, the the like the quick cuts almost give it like a music video quality which you could argue maybe captures Mia's perspective better as someone who spends a lot of her free time watching like dance videos and TV and things like that but you know that's kind of a a thin read of justification for what in retrospect just kind of feels like a dated stylistic choice for me but there's no part of the movie that I would say is badly shot or badly edited. Um, and there are some visuals in there that are good, but I, I you know, I wouldn't say, uh, th that the visuals stand out to me as like exceptional in that regard. What do we think of the, um, the sort of the slow introduction of the, uh, fast Bender character. So, uh, his, his name is Connor, right. In, in the narrative of the film. And he's clearly, so he, he's, uh, he's someone that one time, uh, Mia's mom brings home, right. Um, and first of all, like he, he seems a little bit different from, you know, not only like the, the, the people in that house, but also just kind of the immediate neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? There's something a little bit more clean cut about him, right? Uh, some of the music choices that, that he has, right? They're, they're not hip hop, right? They happen to be, uh, like oftentimes like rock songs, uh, and, and stuff that he considers to be, you know, fairly meaningful, Lyrically, and of course, we get that with some of the rap choices, especially at the end of the film. But uh, very often, the rap choices are more kind of like specifically for, you know, uh, like like raw lyricism without necessarily that kind of like uh, undercurrent of meaning, um, or you know, like just for the sake of rhythm, let's say. But so he he's someone that comes from like a different kind of environment, it seems, right? He has a different accent from them. But he also seems to be, like, very, very good with kids, right? That's uh, one of the things that stands out immediately. So, like, even when uh, uh, Maya has this kind of outright hostility to him from the beginning, uh, she notices how when uh, he's, he's leaving, right, and, his, and, and her sister uh, is, like, saying something like, oh, you, you know, this is the gate. You have to, you know, you have to pay money to pass the gate. And he, you know, he, he, he plays along, right? He gives her a little bit of money. And you see her smiling at that, right? And, and uh, or you see Maya, rather, sm smiling at yeah. that. And, and finally feeling, you know, maybe this is for the first time, like the first male in her life that is, you know, like doing something like positive for the kids in some way, mm -hmm. right? Someone that is on the one hand, like he's he's not he's not like uh, 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 putting himself in in her family as a father figure necessarily, right? That's not really what's going on at the beginning. You know, he's friendly, you know, but he's also an adult. He's acting like an adult. He maintains a little bit of that kind of magic. There is a bit a little bit of a fatherly quality there, but you know, only to the extent that what he spends what maybe like a few weeks up to maybe a couple of months in their life like there's going to be a little bit of a fatherly like adult thing coming off but um you know he, he's more enigmatic than anything and uh without even having to get like all this like backstory about like oh and you know uh mia's father mia's father left them when when you know they were born and like you don't need any sob stories you could tell just by the kind of like what's going on in the family you could sort of, you know, uh, figure out some of what's going on. You don't need the specifics, right? You just need the, the broad strokes that already exist in your head if you do a little bit of work, right? Because there's, there's enough work that's been done for you, right, by the writing where you don't need, you know, some of that spoon feeding going on. But, you know, he's an interesting, uh, enigmatic uh, character from the very beginning. And the sort of kind of like slow unfolding to, you know, like, I, I mean, he is, like, obviously at the end, right? He is a, a, a predator, right? Both in the kind of conventional sense of, like, he's, you know, a, an older man that has sex with a 15-year-old. But also, in just in the broader sense of, like, first of all, uh, he, you know, he, he, he has, like, a, a family of his own, right? We find out later on a daughter of his own, probably, which is why he's good with kids. Like, he has some of that experience. Um, but he did sort of, like, not that he necessarily made, promises to uh, Mia's father, uh, mother or whatever, but 
you know, he did insinuate himself into their lives, right? He saw that, okay, if I'm just going to have sex with this woman and never see her again uh, after a couple of months, like, this is going to be hurtful for everybody involved, right? There's that, that kind of, like, low-key predation going on as well. And just just also, like, the, this idea that, you know, he he does ultimately at the end present himself as a father figure, right? Almost like this is the direction that he wants to go in. And then just like you could imagine with everything else that Mia must have gone through in her in her 15 years of life, you know, betrays that trust as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not done in melodramatic fashion. No. It, it's, it's, it's not done in a way where uh, she, uh, maybe she does initially run after him to sort of like either get some kind of closure or maybe like she believes there might be some kind of relationship uh, uh, with it. Uh, but when she ultimately sees like, okay, well, I, I have this camcorder, I see that there's a, there's a daughter here, you know, he, she essentially tries to do this again, this impulsive thing without a plan. Like, let me, you know, kidnap her and, um, and, and, uh, you know, just kind of like see what happens, kind of get my revenge that way. Right. But, um, you know, like he, he, he's also very well sketched. Like I, I, I saw, I saw this, I saw this critique of the film work. Like it was a ne- negative review and it said something like, uh, uh, it would have been more difficult, right, for the director to find, to, like, deal with the fallout of Fassbender's actions. And to me, it was like, no, it wouldn't. You know, I, I think that the perfect ending is he does what he does, right? He has that predatory aspect. And you, again, immediately bring the, the all, every aspect and all the narrative back to Mia. How does she respond to this? What does she want? What does she do? Does she act impulsively? Does she have some sort of plan? Does she move on in some other way? Um, d- specifically bringing it back to her because I mean like what, 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 what exactly is he going to deal with like w- w- fall down one way I mean I guess there could be like legal consequences of, of some sort I'm not exactly sure what the, what the laws in London are um, you know maybe there's those kind of consequences maybe he could be like oh I feel like such a piece of shit I f-. but I mean we already know that we already know that he feels that he, make, he made a mistake here Right, that he sort of went too far. You get the sense that he's kind of like fucking around on his family all the time. This is merely another iteration. Maybe he pushes things things too far in this one instance, but we don't really need to know that much else about him. Like we we just know what he does, and and, and that's sufficient in that way. Yeah, I I, I think I I would say actually in general the Fassbender character is probably the strongest bit of storytelling in the movie in general. I, I mean, the the overall movie as a depiction of both Mia's experiences and a little bit her perspective on her experiences is successful overall. But the Fassbender character really has a lot of layers to it. And I honestly don't know how much of that is the script and how much of that is just because Michael Fassbender has like a na- kind of a natural proclivity for finding the the different layers of a character. You know, he plays Edwin Epps in uh, 12 Years a Slave, and he could have very easily played that character as just like, uh, you know, this totally brutal sociopath, which he does get that, but he also manages to find like the kind of pathetic and emotionally needy aspects of that character as well. Uh, So this really is just something that he kind of does as an actor almost like instinctively. But... Uh, in regards to that review that you mentioned, I don't exactly know what that even means because this, I, th- this is probably we we are probably witnessing Mia's loss of her virginity, at least in terms of something that, I, m- I mean it's a it's a statutory rape, but she, it, you know I I, I don't know. Well, 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 they say that she hasn't had a boyfriend. Well, you know, I mean, you don't know. I mean, she is very impulsive, you know, but you but you sense that she's actually a little bit uncomfortable around the act of intimacy, because at one point her and Billy, who's 19 and you would and, you know, comes from an even poorer background and you would think would be a pretty sexually free kind of guy. You know, they 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 bum some money off of the Michael Fassbender character and they buy some alcohol and they go to like you know, either the same abandoned apartment that she goes to or, you know, a different substantially similar one. And it shows them just kind of like sitting next to each other and he yeah, looks that, over. That, yeah, that was a good shot. Maybe, yeah. Maybe they had sex. Maybe they didn't. Oh, but... I th- well, I think it's strongly implied that they did not. I mean, yeah. you can't you can't say one way or the other, but it's clear that he's not like yeah, it, it, some it, Lothario yeah, yeah, character, yeah, exactly. you know. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the face of someone 
who, you know, just had, you know, a happy sexual encounter, like a male, you know, had fun, and now they're just looking at each other. It was almost as if maybe maybe he couldn't sexually perform, right? That that was a, a thought that crossed my mind, right? Uh, it's not exactly clear what happens, but um, the fact that that was, like, not even spelled out, and you just see mm-hmm. their faces, you know, when I was talking about like, the good shots or in the film, that, that would be an example to me, right, specifically for the purposes of furthering along a story, a character, right? Just a very quick sketch. I mean, you don't need anything more, and you get, you know, these interesting ambiguities there. Well, yeah, and I also, I don't know how much of that is the shot and how much of that, that, you know, that performance by that actor isn't spectacular, but his performance in that moment, like that look that she got, that Andre Arnold got on his face, however she got it, was very effective because it made him look very boyish in that moment. You know, like previously you had seen him, you know, with his brothers and they're kind of terrorizing her, but they disappear at some point in the movie. You know, maybe they just hopped in their car or their trailer and they went somewhere else or maybe they're doing work or whatever. But I mean, what what I took away was basically like she put herself in a situation where she thought he might make a move and he just didn't know how, you know, or he wasn't confident enough or you know maybe he felt weird on some level because he's 19 and she's 15 or whatever but there was just a moment of hesitation and you know i mean maybe there was something off screen that happened between them but they it certainly doesn't quite they don't like you sense that that might happen after the end of the movie but they don't really feel like like lovers at any point in the movie that you see them um, but anyway, going back to the to the Michael Fassbender character, you know, he has so many like little reactions. Like, for example, I mentioned that at one point her and Billy, they go to his place of work. He's a security guard at a hardware store or I guess it's it's lo- over here. It's loss prevention. I worked at a Kohl's for eight years and that's kind of what retail over here calls it. But, you know, he. uh they go to him and they say, can we have five bucks? This boy is so skinny, he needs food, but really they want to buy booze. Uh, And you see in his eyes at that moment, like on the one hand, he's kind of amused, like, oh, aren't aren't they cute, these two teenagers? But there is also like a hint of jealousy in his eyes. Like, you know, it's almost like with his character, he's almost just like like a serial manipulator and he doesn't even have to try. Like, he, you know, to to the extent that the movie is about like if it's about anything it's about yeah, or it not about exactly. Uh one thing that is featured in the movie is sort of like patterns of behavior that people have a trouble slipping out of because they they have worked for them for one reason or another. His pattern of behavior is being like reflexively charming. You know, is like you know, playing along with people, banter, you know, whatever they say, he can think of like a witty little thing to say or to play along with it or whatever. And and he sort of reflexively puts himself in the good graces of people. And you, you, and you can see how, like, he's conflicted over Mia, whether he sees her as, like, the daughter of his new, you know, sort of girlfriend, sort of fuck buddy, Uh, that he wants to impress with his, like, you know, oh, look how good I am with kids. But, you know, he does also notice that she's, like, you know, a a teenager. I mean, and that she is, he can tell that she's attracted to him as well. And I think his sort of impulse in that moment is to be a little bit flirtatious and to sort of gradually escalate, like, physical contact and intimacy and things like that. And and she she picks up on the fact that he's doing that. She plays along with it. You know, there's one scene where her mom has a party and has a bunch of people over. And, you know, you see she's not the best mom because she basically says, go upstairs or get out of the house because there's no kids allowed downstairs. And Mia sneaks away a bottle of vodka and she goes in her mom's room and starts like, you know, kind of just looking at her things. You know, she looks at her birth control pills in her purse and she she starts putting on some of her makeup as she sips on the vodka and, you know, that's an, that's another moment where you see, like, there is a part of her that just kind of wants to be like a normal girl her own age, you know, like she's not, you know, she doesn't dress like a tomboy in the movie, you know, she actually dresses somewhat femininely, you know, she has like big dangling earrings, she's not afraid of makeup and, you know, and she falls asleep on her mom's bed and they, 
she wakes up with them kind of talking about her, Michael Fassbender and her mother. And he says, oh, you know, she, we don't have to wake her up. I'll just carry her to bed. And she, like, you can tell that she's not sure how to feel in that moment because on the one hand, he's being, like, fatherly. But on the other hand, and and this is really weird, and you, and I and I don't know how to take this from his perspective. After he puts her in the bed, he actually takes her pants off of her, which is, like, startlingly inappropriate for you know a man in his late 20s early 30s whatever he's supposed to be in this movie to do for any teenage girl whether he whether it's his girlfriend's daughter or not and and, it, and it's her and she is awake and it's hard to tell if she know if he knows that she's awake and he's kind of doing it as like an escalation of intimacy and like you know i see you i see the way that you look at me you know he also starts like tying her shoelaces together as like a prank or whatever to kind of build like rapport with her or or whatever and again you don't know if he can tell that she's awake or not but you know there is this kind of gradual escalation but it's almost like i don't know that he's like that the first time he saw her he was like oh this is somebody i'm definitely gonna fuck i think it's just like in the same way that she reflexively and instinctively like lashes out at people, I think he sort of reflexively and instinctively uh, either acts like a father or he acts like a flirtatious, like you know, would be lover to like women. And she's kind of age wise and well, maturity wise, she's she's very immature, but you know, like development wise, in between. And so he kind of fills both roles and I, I don't want to say he's accidentally a predator because he clearly at some points knows what he's doing like when he grabs her and he spanks her I mean he can't not know how she's going to take that and what she's going to think about that but I don't think it's a I don't think it's a product of deliberation and planning it's more so like something that he kind of pulls himself into like all you know he's almost like a in some ways like a prisoner of his own like behavioral tendencies in the same way that Mia is yeah, uh, the way that those moments individually get built up, like there's there's like on the one hand, um, <clears throat> you know, inappropriateness, but there's also like sufficient plausible deniability for everybody involved, right? And it also says other th uh, things about other characters there. So, like, so yeah, like when when he carries her um, into the bedroom, uh, the f the first thing that I noticed was during that just you know before we, we g even get to the bedroom, just the act of carriage. All we hear is just breathing, right? He's he's breathing in this kind of, you know, gruff, masculine way. You know, he's kind of, like, struggling to, to uh, bring her up. Um, she's, you know, breathing much more lightly. And obviously, like, there's, you know, this kind of, like, uh, you know, there, there is supposed to be some sort of, very, you know, at the very least, like, a sexual implication, right? You, you get, you know, those kinds of breathing sounds, like, during sex, right? But you get them in other contexts, too, right? You know, that's like, uh, aesthetically speaking, right, that would be like an aesthetic, uh, plausible deniability there, right? Um, then when we get to the bedroom, I mean, uh, you you, uh, you can make the argument that this is uh, inappropriate, but I can also imagine plenty of people, you know, even if they might think twice, they're like, well, you know, if, if I'm going to be falling asleep, like, in my pants, like, well, first of all, like, I, I, I hate that idea, the idea of sleeping in my pants. Uh, if I were to pass out drunk... Um, you know, like uh, I, I, I would want to be like pantsless when I'm sleeping, and you know, there's there's that layer of plausible deniability there too. It's kind of like, well, I'm just being in a fatherly manner, especially like if we get the sense like, okay, so now it's like a couple months later, he's insinuating himself into their lives. Uh, maybe he's like serious about the mom, right? And you could sort of like play off both angles. Like if if you don't know what the film is about prior to this happening. Right. You 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 definitely get the, the discomfort, but you also get other aspects as well. There aren't necessarily like nefarious all the way through. But I agree that as you know, the evidence starts to sort of accumulate little by little, um, you have no other way to read it. So like even before we get to the spanking scene, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, I, I do find it interesting. So, like I, I said earlier, how the film is like full of these kinds of like anarchic, sort of like ever shifting alliances and relationships between people, right? Which is a fairly common in these kinds of environments. Um, and one thing that I noticed early on is like, so as as uh, uh, Mia's mom is is getting serious about uh, Connor, uh, one day Mia like goes downstairs, right, to like get something to eat or whatever. Right, it's breakfast time, and she's just wearing her like, you know, like it's not it's not like panties, but it's like some sort of like boy shorts or whatever. Um, 
and and she tells her immediately like go go put on some clothes and Mia's like you, you never told me to do that before right and you could tell the reason why she's bothered is like in this world of like you know looking out for yourself and ever shifting alliances your daughter might also you know like uh, get the love interest of your potential partner right uh, it's 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 that kind of mentality as well Right. So, you know, at that point, there has to be something, you know, sort of going on. Maybe this is leading to somewhere. And then ultimately, like after enough sort of like, um, you know, bonding uh, occurs between Connor and Maya. Uh, uh, I keep saying Maya. It's Mia. Oh, Mia, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, well, I, I, I have, um, you know, I, 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 I also know someone uh, that's that's very young her name Maya and it's like Maya Maya so anyway I, I, I get mixed up yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway so so Mia well I did say Mia a few times and I say Maya yeah, a few other you, times yeah, you've gone, you've gone I, I go in between they yeah call her Mia in the movie it's it's all in the in light of uh, the anarchic sort of our relationships yes. right we're gonna we're, we're gonna shift these alliances of pronounce, yeah, pronunciation inst- instrumentalizing his relationship to this fictional character so so um, uh, later on like when this all kind of comes to a head even before the sex scene we, we have the spanking scene right he he grabs her right he, I forget exactly what the sort of like uh, um, what the joke is supposed to be in terms of like, what is she being punished for. But he, but he uh, spanks her s- several times forcefully, and she jumps up, and he's laughing. And you see in her face, you know, this, like, it was very well acted, this, like, total, total shock, right? Yeah. Um, and you don't, you don't but, but you also get the sense that this isn't going to cause, like, a break between them. This isn't going to cause a rift. Even if she doesn't want it, right, she still has that curiosity that she's going to try to explore at some point later on. But uh, I, I do find interesting how, like, in that particular scene, like, I, I think it would have been too much to kind of also give her, it would have been also, like, unrealistic to give her this, like, sense of, like, oh, she's shocked, but she's also clearly, look at her face and, and mouth, she's so curious. Like, there was none of that. It was just the shock, right? Yeah, well, she's um, 15, yeah exactly, you know, exactly. Like, like I mean, it, it, would, like, it wouldn't be realistic, you, like, you know? Like, you have to have a little bit of sexual, you have to have... A little bit of sexual experience before you start getting a little curious about i mean unless you've been like I, I, this does not always go for people that have like lived in like sexually abusive situations although there's not specifically any indication that mia has had anything like that in her life but you know you have to have a little bit of sexual experience before like i mean spanking is not like super kinky but it's technically kink you know compared to just vanilla sex so like you, you wouldn't imagine that she immediately just has curiosity or whatever like it's she's just surprised that he would go that far I think in that moment like and she's not sure how to take it because she is not sure she's not sure what he wants and she's not exactly even sure what she wants toward him because I think she inherently has resentment toward anybody that is like dating her mom I mean you can imagine that probably her mom has dated nothing but assholes her whole life if she's ever even had a relationship uh Uh, but also, you know, like the fact that this guy is actually seems like a decent guy and that she does find herself like somewhat attracted to him, you know, is she's like, she, she didn't expect that out of him. And it was, was kind of a stark escalation of the, I don't know, like the, 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 the kinesthetic, uh, connection that the two of them have. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like it, it, it was just a, a, a good choice. Right. I mean, yeah. um, j- just to have that level of realism, not break it like for the sake of like, you know, making some other kind of point. Right. We just yeah. uh, just well, have. And, and also the fact that he that he like is so smooth, like the mom walks in shortly after and she doesn't e- you know, she doesn't even seem to notice that her daughter has this look on her face like, what the fuck just happened to me? And he just walks out like, hey, babe, what's going on? Let's go yeah. downstairs. Yeah. You know, and and and. To the extent that th- there's always this like self-justifying tendency of this character, he could say, "Well, I was just being playful, and you know, she has been a little bit of a shit recently." You know, while he's doing it, he says, "This is for running out on the social worker," and that's another thread in the movie is that Mia has seemingly gotten kicked out of like every school in the area that she can go to, so they wanted to send her to like uh, like a reform school or uh, some kind of boarding school for like behaviorally problematic kids or whatever and that's why i think when we keep saying like you know a few months or whatever i actually think it is a much shorter timeline because at one point they say oh you're starting this in two weeks and she leaves before she is supposed to start that program so So, 
Yeah, yeah. If, if you think about it, that yeah, I mean, um, that that's. Uh, I, I mean, it could have been pushed on a little bit, something just kind of, kind of like the way that she is. But I mean, yeah, that that that's also a very. It's kind of like a whirlwind kind of experience, right, for someone that. You know, maybe never had any positive uh, male role models, father, fatherly figures. So uh, ultimately, we, we get to the point um, after the spanking. So uh, another part of the film is she she sees this uh, audition advertisement, right, for dancing. And uh, Connor sees this and says, like, listen, uh, you, you might need some sort of like video camera or whatever to do an audition tape. You could borrow mine. Um, and that's what happens, right? So she sends it in, and after she sends it in, he uh, he, he uh, uh, comes by and is like, "Well, actually, maybe she didn't send it in just yet." But anyway, whatever the the word events is, um, ultimately she comes downstairs. The the mother's passed out. She's like sleeping upstairs, uh, and he, she sees Connor. Like uh, it's like dark, right? It's uh, it's almost uh, morning actually, and he's drinking and she's been drinking. They're all constantly. That's another thing. Like they're all constantly drinking throughout the film. Like everybody, pretty much, right? Well, well it's almost like I, I don't think that's his de facto state of being though, because because when in this scene he hands her like the beer or cider or whatever that he's been drinking and says, "You people love your alcohol in this family, it's, don't yeah, you?" Yeah, it's, it's some. It's and it's because he comes from a alcohol. different class of people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, so to him, this is kind of like, all right, I'm gonna sort of like disorient my senses, yeah. right, in this way where to me this is like a, a, a vacation away from home, right, from my sort of like ordinary family life. Um, but to them, this is kind of like this perpetual state of uh, you know stupefaction in the sense. Uh, which gives like another layer of like you know to to the extent that this is like a child's perspective, it's a kind of like almost you know it's not necessarily uh, uh, very sober, right? It's eventually sober ring near the end, but yeah. um, so any so anyway, so she, she comes down downstairs. He gives her this like hard liquor, right? And so they start sharing the bottle, and he asks her like, oh, so this like audition that you did, that or rather no, so yes, yeah, so she does. Yeah, she sent, the she, she's she's sent the it audition. in. And now she's and now she's practicing the the actual dance she's going to do when she shows up to the audition, and he's like, all right, so like show show me show me what this is, um, and she's kind of shy about it, but she eventually relents and she she shows the dance. And it's important to say that the dance is to a song that he played for them earlier yeah. in the movie, which is a uh, frankly like kind of terrible like blues soul cover of mm. California Dreamin' by the Mamas and the Papas, like so boring, so such an elevator music version of that song. And that's one way you can tell that he's kind of like, uh, you know, underneath the superficial charm, he is a little bit of a hollow person because like all of his, you know, cultural touchstones or whatever that he shows to them are just like the most like boring British white guy, like hipstery kind of affectations that you could imagine. Yeah, which they themselves are kind of disconnected from. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, being where they live. They don't normally go, for example, where he takes them to, like, a river and, like, catches a fish with his hands and then, you know, spears it into, like... Uh, the idea, I guess, is to cook it later, but instead it's, like, ends up on the floor. Yeah. Um, and so, but, you know, to, to them, this is kind of, like, foreign anyway. But anyway, so she's dancing for him, and eventually they... Uh, so she sits down, and he says, you know, that, that was great. You know, I think you're going to get... I think you're going to do well in your audition. Puts his hand on, on her shoulder, and eventually they, they kiss. And this uh, very quickly leads to sex. So, uh, and Keith, Keith mentions earlier how um, that scene in particular has kind of like also that childlike quality of like this is very much from her perspective. The, 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 the coloration there is very much like dreamlike, right? This is, um, and you know, to some extent, this might be a little bit his perspective too, because, uh, you know, like I, although he probably has cheated many times in his, uh, on his family, uh, he, you know, may, I assume maybe this is the first time that he, you know, fucked like a 15 year old. Right. Um, Since he was 15. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. So. Um, uh, uh, and, and but like so as that's happening. Right. I, I, I did notice this kind of shift that happens in the scene and also to some extent, even a little bit like Maya's response and maybe you see like physically like how, how the scene is presented. You also see like a shift where like during sex. uh like, even at that point, I feel like you still have, like, a little bit of plausible deniability where you think, like, just look at a tiny bit, like, okay, well, he's probably, like, so emotionally fucked up 
that he sees this girl that, okay, she's a teenager, she's 15, but much of what she's gone through, she's probably like physically been through more, more adult things that may, than maybe he's ever been through in his life. And you get a little bit of the plausible deniability where it's like, okay, well, maybe he's so confused by all this that he thinks like, all right, she, she might as well be like almost 20 or something. Like, and like you could sort of see that maybe a little bit in his mind, but that completely goes away when during a sex, right, he says something like, uh, well, I, I bet like your, you know, like 15 year old, like teenage friends or whatever can't fuck you like this, do they? Right? They don't well, have. He a... says that boy. That yeah, the, yeah, that that, that boy. Is better than that 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 boy is my isn't my cock bigger than his? Yeah, exactly. And he says like yeah. you know is isn't my cock bigger than his? So, like immediately that that you know takes like if there's like a tiny hint of like plausible nobility left, this completely obliterates it. Right? This is not like a, a tender, affectionate moment. Uh, for him, right? Uh, it, may, it may feel that way to her, right? But it's not this way to him, right? He's treating it very much like he had another conquest. And yeah. when this comes kind of to his head, like, okay, shit, like, okay, I am treating this as yet another sexual conquest. But I also, I committed, uh, again, I'm assuming he committed a crime. Um, and, and, you know, now he wants to like, get out, right? Maybe he would have like stayed longer if this thing didn't transpire, maybe it would have been a few weeks longer, maybe a couple months, like whatever it might be, he would have strung them along. Mm -hmm. But then, like, he uses that as an opportunity to, like, totally uh, escape, right, go back to his family. And this kind of, like, stupefied dream state that he sort of put himself in, kind of, like, slumming it, right, slumming it with, the, with these uh, uh, people, right? And it kind of, like, it also makes you wonder, like, he probably wouldn't be able to do this with, a, you know, like another uh, middle class sort of... Uh, uh, family, right? He sort of had, yeah, that's another kind of like predatory quality, right? He, he knows who these people are. He knows what they've been through. He could tell by their family dynamics that this is, you know, this is not very, uh, uh healthy. Um, and despite sort of like pretending to be a sort of, you know, father figure, you know, he does essentially betray everybody involved, right? Um, not just his own family. Yeah, and it's also kind of telling that his job is a uh, security guard at a hardware store. You know, he is an interloper in this community in more ways than one. And in addition, in addition, in addition to being sexually predatory towards kind of this family, honestly, uh, you know, because the there is a, a scene where the mom is on the phone with somebody and she's really. Like, she tries to say, oh, it's really just about sex and he's so good at it. But you can tell that she's actually, like, really impressed by and kind of falling for him a little bit. And, you know, he just leaves her high and dry, which is devastating to her. And then, of course, the behavior towards Mia as well. But, you know, in addition to that, you know, he almost, by virtue of the job that he has, has to exist in, like, a... Uh, uh, like a somewhat predatory relationship toward this community because we've seen the poverty that exists in this place. You know, you see that people kind of, they jump from like $5 that they have in their pocket to $5 that they have in their pocket, you know? And it, I, I'm not saying it's right, but it's like understandable on some level if somebody goes in a hardware store and they lift a little copper wire to try and make some extra money or whatever. And he is purely there just to, you know, be a barrier between them and that and to put them in a position to be punished for that when they do it, you know? So he's, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if predatory is the right word, but he, so, I mean, he makes his bones off of it. So he is certainly parasitic on the community in that way, in the same way that despite his, his surface level charm, he's kind of parasitic on this family as well. So, so after the scene where, uh, he and Mia will we'll say have sex cause it's, uh, you, you don't want to, it is statutory rape, but she's kind of consenting to it from her perspective at the time. So you don't want to take away her agency. But, and anyway, after the sexual encounter between the two of them, uh, yeah, he packs up and leaves like immediately. He is gone the next morning uh, and Mia wakes up and she basically chases him in the parking lot shouting, Connor, Connor. And he just completely blows her off. So like to, and he had said, oh, we'll talk tomorrow uh, when he put her to bed after the sexual encounter. So, I mean, clearly, you know, pretty, you know, pretty scummy dirtbag behavior from this guy. And she goes back inside and there's kind of a weak interaction. I would say that the, 
the the mother is not a bad character, but I think the interactions between her and Mia are maybe like the weakest part of the story. And there's a pretty weak interaction where she's looking through her mother's purse for her cell phone to get his number so she can bother him and call him. And the mother is just like over there, like crying, like, oh, this guy is left. And she's like, did you know I almost had you aborted? I even had an uh, I even had an appointment like doesn't really. I, I mean, it's not clear to me if she knows what happened between the two of them or if she blames her because like, oh, you were such an asshole to him. You know, of course, he wasn't going to stay. Or if it's like she blames the act of having kids in general, like, oh, of course, this guy's not going to want a woman that has two kids. Oh, woe is me. Why did I have kids? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, it's it's a, it's just a little out of place in that moment to me. Like, it, it doesn't feel it, it it just it doesn't seem like something that she would say in that moment. I mean, maybe because she's feeling really hurt and vulnerable, but it feels feels a little tacked on, you know, like maybe it's something that could have could have left a later draft of the script when they actually had it in the editing room. But um, she had gone through his wallet earlier in the movie, ostensibly just to to kind of take some money from it. But she had seen his I.D. So I think that's how she figures. I can't remember how she figures out where he lives. Uh, but she basically goes to his address and she finds out at that point, yes, that he has at least a daughter and I think a, it's a, you know, a wife as well. And it's not clear what his wife thought he was doing while he was gone. You know, if he just told her, I mean, they, they, there is a scene where he's having a little bit of an argument with what you can assume is his wife on the phone and Mia hears it. So maybe... That maybe they are kind of on the outs and this is him, you know, they're, in his mind, they're on a break, so it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Or if he's telling them, oh, I'm really busy at work. I can't get away. You know, I'm staying in the city because it's just easier. I'm working so many hours. Like, you don't know exactly what has happened, but it's clear that he's so shook by his act of having taken advantage of this 15 year old that what whatever fun he was having slumming it has uh immediately gone away and he's gone back to his wife in this act of self-contrition or whatever you know and you see that he has a young daughter like three four years old maybe and on some level you know he has to have been thinking like the, this girl that i just had sex with is closer to my own daughter's age than she is to my age like you know clearly there is something something wrong about that uh and and he and she she comes up to his house and he's like oh shit and he immediately ushers her outside and puts her in the car and you know he's saying basically the same thing to her that he said the last time they interacted which is you know this is my family you know you're 15 like we can't have a relationship i hope you understand that i'll call you next week when i'm not so busy or, or when i go back to work or something like that you know and she has this like thing in her brain where she kind of will because it's it's shown that she has called him like over and over and over again, like over and over, like one after the other before that. So she does have kind of a, a, a persistence or an insistence or something to her. So she just immediately goes back to his house and he's actually gone and she breaks in and she looks around and she looks on the on the video camera and sees that you know footage of him interacting with his daughter and she you know it's unclear exactly what she thinks is going to happen does she want to expose him to his wife and then she decides against it because of the daughter or is she just jealous like either f romantically or sexually or in terms of class or whatever but she when they come home she realizes like shit i've been get i've done breaking and entering and she just pees on the floor and flees the house and then it's after that that there's the scene where she lures his daughter like his daughter has a little scooter thing that she's going up and down the sidewalk with and she l lures her away says oh i'm what she say i'm a friend of your dad's or your parents or something yeah, like that you like need to like, oh, yeah i've got to take you to go get some they told me to take you to go get some ice cream or something like that and she's so young that she just goes with her and this kind of leads into, I guess, what you could call the the denouement of the movie. Yeah. So um, at that point, she, you know, she essentially kidnaps uh, the daughter Kira, and um, it, 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 it's it's the same sort of thing at the beginning, right? Where uh, it's an inversion of it, obviously. But when she tries to like free the horse, right? It, it was uh, 
uh, maybe she had good intentions, but it wasn't necessarily something that had any sort of, you know, forethought, any kind of plan. It was just impulsive. And here, you know, she also impulsively kidnaps the daughter, right? No real plan. I mean, what is she going to do? Like, it's clear that she, you know, she doesn't want to murder anyone, right? Um, th- that's not that's not who she is, right? Uh, there, uh, but, you know, she takes her anyway. They're running off, right? It's one of those, like, pointless acts of revenge that, again, given the situation that she finds herself in, um, given her kind of, like, life circumstances, you, you, you get the sense that, you know, she, she must have done similar things. And, I mean, you do see her do similar things throughout the film, right? Whether it's, like, pointless fights that she gets into. It's, like, a kind of, you know, let's call it a self-expression, uh, impulsiveness, in this case, revenge, that doesn't really lead anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have a purpose. It's just this kind of, like, you know, manic spray, right, in any kind of given direction. Um, and so she, they're kind of, like, going through these, like, little prairies or whatever, Right. Um, and at, at some point, uh, you think there might be like physical danger because she inadvertently pushes her into a river uh, and has to like, you know, give her a stick so that she could fish herself out because she herself, it seems like she's not able to swim. And then ultimately, she she just like brings her home. Right. And and uh, as she brings uh, the uh, Kira home, uh, Connor comes out, realizes what happens chases her through this field catches uh, catches Mia slaps her hard and just simply walks off right so to the extent that others were seeking some you know let, 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 let's get to the bottom of this fallout let's examine the fallout you don't need anything more than that right mm-hmm. you know that was the final kind of like all right so you know we fucked around we had our fun I decided that it was too much but now you interfered way too much in my world, my boundaries, right? Um, my world is not your world. Your world is not my world. You know, I was uh, essentially slumming it. And that was kind of like what the slap represents. It was, it wasn't voiced. It was, you know, it, there, was, there was nothing attached to it. It was simply that and this look of hatred, right? You know, now leave me alone. And that was it, right? I mean, you, you know that there was no, you know, uh, tenderness uh, pretty much in anything here, right? So... Yeah. You, you do, like, in retrospect, um, you know, if you watch the film a second or a third time, right, obviously you're going to see some of the early behaviors in a different light. Um, you might see some of them more kind of, like, really charismatic and positive interactions as having this veneer of, you know, it was constructed specifically in that way to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not even, I mean, I wasn't, you know, it's not even obvious to me that from the beginning, right, he was, like, out, like, to get Mia, right, in bed, Right. It's just, you know, things just sort of like fall into that direction, specifically for men that, you know, behave kind of like in this other fashion. Right. It it seemed to me like it was kind of like a slippery slope from one form of predation to another form of predation. Right. Because like there is not that very easy, obvious boundary. Right. Like, you know, he 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 may not be the type of guy that we try to like sexually abuse like a six year old. Right. But a 15 year old, a 16 year old, one that has you know, uh, some level of life experience different from his own, right? That in some ways might be, you know, even a little bit more mature than he is, right? Um, You know, to the extent that she... More seasoned. Yeah, like, like, yeah, exactly. Like, like, yeah, yeah, has seen, has seen more, right? You could imagine a man like that, you know, like making this conflation between, you know, what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, you know, by choosing, you know, for his own purposes, for his own advantage, to not see age in that specific, you know, instantiation. So, um, and and so, uh, yeah, there's there's also that, that audition uh, that happens, right, which is another example of, like, this kind of, you know, de facto abandonment, right, where she ultimately does show up to the audition, and the first thing she sees is, you know, some woman on stage clearly like stri- stripping doing some kind of erotic dancing right and she's like you know shit like this isn't exactly what i wanted to do right i wanted to actually dance i wanted to showcase what i perceive to be my skill set right going back to the very beginning right to the extent that there is any kind of like wannabe transcendence or whatever it's like you know she wants to hold on to the fact that she does have a set of skills that she's constantly tinkering with and cultivating throughout the film and here this is just kind of like yet another you know uh, betrayal right like another kind of like you know bodily like objectification right nobody wants to see her for anything that she might have internally like even you know this guy right wants to be like father-like in a sense 
right? Maybe maybe he sees something in her that makes her worthwhile. Maybe there's something worthwhile about her mother that is like worthy of an actual relationship, right? And not just a fling. And here, you know, we have this uh, a dance audition, and it's not what she thinks it is. And she she puts on the song, right? It's it's again that uh, California dreaming song, and uh, it starts playing, and she just decides against any kind of dancing and just like leaves the stage and, and leaves uh, for good. And ultimately uh, leaves uh, her, her family, right? It's a positive interaction near the end where although they curse at each other, whatever, call each other names, like there's this kind of idea of, of a near of love underneath. And you do get that sense like throughout the film that there is not necessarily this kind of like, uh, you know, it's not it, like some families have this like enduring hatred that never goes away. Some families merely explode at each other randomly, right? I mean, my family has always been like that when I was growing up. Maybe it's a Russian thing. Maybe it's something else. But we could be like sitting there, you know, and and uh, very suddenly my grandma says something in Russia that I don't like or I say something that she doesn't like or, you know, it was like the same way with like my mom. And suddenly there's an explosion. Five minutes later, everything's back to normal. It's as if it never happened, right? And you get, you know, a lot of that going on with this family. I wish, though, there would have been more positive and loving and affectionate interactions there where maybe the ending felt like a little bit forced right where um you don't see enough of that kind of undercurrent of really how they feel about one another um but you know you do get that positive interaction near the end and she goes off with billy uh to uh, i believe to wales Right to this new kind of life, and you know who knows if she sort of gives up on these dreams or whatever. But it definitely does feel that that audition is a kind of, if not a closure to that particular dream, but a closure maybe in that specific place of that dream, right? Where this is what the auditions are like. This is what you know people are after. Uh, try to do something else elsewhere, right? But then you know you you get back get back to this idea of you know you can never no matter where you go no matter where you travel you can never truly escape yourself right you're always having to deal with that um innateness right and and uh uh that's never going to change so yeah in terms of like there being a loving interaction between Mia and her family I, I would say part of the problem is that, in my estimation, the mother and the sister are probably, like, the weakest acted roles in the movie of, like, the main roles. Yeah. You know, the, the mother is not bad, but she doesn't quite find the level where, like, like, for example, in the scene where they go to a river and they go catch some some fish and she, she wades in the water with Michael Fassbender and blah, blah, blah. Like, there are some comments that she makes where I, I think a, an actor that was thinking it through a little bit more might have included a little bit of warmth in, in addition to... Because, like, they're sort of put-downs, but there's a way that you could do it, like, where it's a mom saying something a little bit... Like, like she's giving the daughter shit, but she's not... Like, she just kind of comes across as, like, contemptuous and annoyed at Mia for most of the movie. And, you know, it sort of undermines it at the end when she's, like, sitting there... To, you know, like, you know, tearfully thinking about her, you know, her precious baby going away from her and they and they dance to that Nas song at the end. It's like it doesn't you know, there there's just a little bit of like interstitium uh, missing in terms of that perspective. And I don't know that it needed to be new scenes. I think it just needed to be slightly different acting of some of the earlier scenes and similar. I mean, the, the little sister is very young, so you're. I, I think with casting kids like that, it's just kind of you get what you get. You know, you, you you do your best to screen them in auditions and then you get what you get. You know, I think maybe because like the, the, the little sister has basically two settings, which is like, oh, you know, I'm a cute little kid. And then like screaming expletives at her. Yeah. You know, there's not exactly, you know, it's not the tree of life where somehow he got like layered acting out of a two year old. You know, it's like. She's she's saying the dialogue and she's doing an okay job, but it's not like a, a deeply nuanced relationship. You know, at the end, she's chasing her with the dog, saying like, "You better text me, you skank, whatever." And you know, it doesn't quite feel earned because they haven't really had a positive interaction at almost any point in the movie up to then. And you can kind of justify it and say, "Well, you know, regardless of that, she's the only other person that kind of understands." 
the sister's named Tyler, I think, that understands Tyler's situation, what's going on with her. Now she's just stuck with this mother that doesn't care about her and probably isn't going to pay that much attention to her. You know, at least fighting with her sister was like a form of human contact. But again, it's like a thin, you know, it's a thin read to, to try to, to hang the justification off of, you know, just doesn't quite work. But um, so so I think we, we've alluded to it a few times now. There's a scene near the end where as she is packing her bag and gearing up to leave with Billy to drive to Wales, uh, she is... She she comes into her and her mother's kind of listening to her Nas CD and it's the song Life was it is it Life's a Bitch or Life's a Bitch and Then You Die I can't remember Life's the full Life's a Bitch is the name of the song yeah yeah uh, but I think the lyric is Life's a Bitch and Then You Die and you kind of almost immediately get the sense of where it's going and she, you know she kind of turns around she's like well go then see you later and then she's kind of dancing to the song and then Mia senses that she needs the connection and she goes in and she starts dancing with her and the little sister is standing behind Mia and holding her and kind of moving with her to the beat and you're supposed to sort of get a moment of like tenderness and connection between the two of them but between the sort of overwrought song choice with the life's a bitch then you die you know I wonder what the symbolism of that is to you know these character situation as well as the fact that it kind of you don't want to say it comes out of nowhere but it comes it doesn't come enough out of somewhere to, you know, and it, it, it just, it feels a little like compared to like the, the plainness of a lot of the other moments in the movie. And I like a good form of plainness, like a straightforwardness. Like it doesn't, it's, it's just not, it, it's like, there's a way that they could have done the movie prior to that, that it's believable, but it doesn't even really feel all that believable in the moment, you know? So it's, it's unfortunate because after that, the fact that she just gets in the car and drives away makes sense. But then you pair the dance scene and then the last shot of the movie is a balloon flying away from this area, like this neighborhood full of tenement housing or whatever, which is is definitely an overwrought piece of yeah. symbolism with which to end the movie. So I, to the extent that there, I, I mean, my to the extent that there are fair criticisms to make of the movie, I think it's, first of all, that ending, like just the kind of, overwrought a little bit treacly a little bit cliche and not and not quite earned components to it and then since this was my second watch through of the movie i will say that it's not necessarily a movie that holds up super well to rewatch. like you pretty much like there's not a lot of hidden depth to it it is very straightforward and it's very well done in its straightforwardness but there really is not much gleaned from it on a second watch through other than like I noticed what it was about the visuals of the sexual encounter between Mia and Connor that kind of stuck in my brain. Or I noticed what it was about the way that they phrased a piece of dialogue in this scene that kind of stuck out. But it, it's not it's not a movie with a great deal of depth. And that's why, even though it's an excellent movie, I would not say it's a great or even like a near great movie. It's like the next tier down below that, you know, where it's just missing a little, little bit of the sub of, of the, of the substance that you can kind of come back to it and really see something different that you didn't see the first time. And I, I personally didn't have any of that. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned all the real girls before. I mean, it's a personal favorite of, my, of mine uh, simply because it's another film that there's virtually no, like, you know, there's no, like, poetic dialogue or anything like that. Um, you have to extract uh, a lot just from the ju juxtapositions, right, and the sort of kind of, like, naturalism of, of the characters and the acting and, you know, sort of, like, trying to understand and, and uh, pick apart people's uh, motivations. Um, but there's also just, like, less, you know, there's less, like, fat in, in all the real girls. Like, you can't point to, like you know, the issue, like all these like major issues with like an ending or whatever, um, you know, characters that, uh, you know, are kind of like important for, you know, some sort of like purported uh, emotional import, but uh, are just kind of like there, you know, tacked on in a sense. Um, and uh, but I, I would definitely uh, put them in a similar category in terms of just like, you know, being well done. Right. Although I, I think uh, all the real, real girls is a superior film. Um, I, 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 I did enjoy the fact that despite that, you know, just looking at the trailers for both films, 
Um, you don't really expect all that much, but you know the, the storytelling is uh, just very well done in, in both cases. And when I, when I was looking at some of the stuff that um, Arnold was saying about her, her I don't know if it's the latest film uh, when she did Cow or maybe if she had something after, but... No, Cow is the latest one. Yeah, I mean, the way that she was describing it, like, you know, like I, I could imagine many uh, filmmakers uh, either trying to play up to some sort of, like, vegan audience or trying to make some other kind of like you know almost like a small p political point but you know she just said you know i i want to capture in an essential way what that life of the cow would be like what it would look like what the images might be right the kind of choices that you'd put in what you would leave out um and, and that, that that's that strikes me immediately as like you know, this is an artist that is a pro, that is approaching these things artistically, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an artist, these these are the, these are the kinds of choices and thoughts that you should be having, right? And she's having those thoughts, so it, it does uh, make me uh, want to check out these uh, these other works, right? I know she had a, at least a couple of other long films and a bunch of short ones too. Uh, I think uh, most of the short ones, at least, are available on Criterion. Fish Tank is available on Criterion, which is where I where I saw it, but. Uh, definitely someone someone to to check out. Yeah, I haven't seen her other films. My my wife has seen I think her next feature was American Honey, if I'm not mistaken, is the name of it. And she she kind of said it was similar to Fish Tank but not quite as good and then yeah, her latest one was Cow, which I I was I was also rather intrigued by and maybe Maybe a future episode. Who knows? You know, this the series can go anywhere. I, I I remembered a thought that I never finished earlier because we kind of got hung up on something. Um, in regards to the review that you said uh, was kind of complaining that the film either was flawed or didn't have the guts because it didn't show like the fallout of Connor's behavior towards Mia. I mean, I don't know what people want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the 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 best thing about this movie is that. It doesn't really indulge in like the melodrama of it all. You know, it pretty pl shows you a pretty plain depiction of like the behavior of the characters. And then you it allows you as the viewer to kind of fill in the feelings like based on your understanding of people and the situation and how you or somebody like that, you know, that is like these people or not like these people would behave, you know, it respects your intelligence. It treats you like an adult. And to say that we need a scene of her, like, you know, crying in the shower because this guy is like screwed her over or, you know, like, you know, the scene of her in the field getting slapped is enough. You know, it's that moment where she realizes that she fucked up by the kidnapping and he is so pissed, but he's also acknowledging on some level by the fact that he just slaps her and then walks away, doesn't say anything. Like, I understand that I fucked you over as well. We're even, you know? And that's not, they're not even psychologically. I mean, clearly, if this is her first sexual encounter, the fact that it happened in this context is going to be in some ways like formative to her either sexually or psychologically or emotionally or whatever but we don't really need to see that like if you're an adult that understands like the basics of human sexuality you understand that it doesn't you know maybe in the 1960s you would have needed to depict something like that but i think in 2000 either in 2009 or 2022 you know, I would rather the artist respect my intelligence and respect my time. I didn't need to see her kvetching about this guy. I didn't need to see her having a fight with her mom where her mom's like, I, or, or the sister tells the mom what happened. And the mom's like, I knew it. You get out of my house. You know what? Like, you don't. And also like, what is the fallout going to be for someone like Mia specifically? Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, probably that reviewer that wrote that line. I mean, I can't say for sure, but they probably come from a different class background than someone like Mia. You know, this would have been a bigger deal in her life. But you sense from the movie that Mia is someone that like shitty little things like this probably happen to her all the time. And it's probably going to continue happening, you know. So on some level, it makes sense that it's just something that she moves on from. And to the extent that it can affect her later, it's probably going to be like sublimated into some other impulsive action that she has in the future. And, 
either, you know, and either she will or will not learn to kind of control these feelings and figure out the source of them and blah, blah, blah. But it's to the movie's credit that it doesn't, you know, until maybe the last scene or two really indulge in a lot of that melodrama. You know, it's to the movie's credit that it doesn't spoon feed you uh, the character's psychology and it trusts that you understand people enough to be able to like you can it, it goes to other intricacies of these interactions and these uh, and the you know these these people situations that are frankly a lot more like sociologically interesting and also just artistically interesting you know there's been a mil like there's a million movies where you could see basically what that reviewer is asking for from this but there's really i mean i'm not gonna say there's only one fish tank but there's not that many fish tanks you know so i appreciated it yeah um very good film uh we will you know we'll probably check out something else uh from arnold and uh maybe do a movie macro on on that um, it also reminds me of this other uh, r reviewer, uh, Deborah Ross, I believe, in The Spectator. She said something like, it wasn't a negative review, but she did say something like, I'm confused by Connor's motivations. <laughs> um, this also s seems maybe it's a class thing, maybe not, maybe, uh, uh, but it's like. Well, he's probably confused about his motivation. Like, he's probably confused about his motivations to some degree. Like, that's kind of the, like the ambiguity of the character is the point of the character like I, I mean maybe specifically in the moment of or like immediately after or immediately proceeding but generally speaking I mean you know he, he he's someone that uh, wants to you know get out of his like boring middle class life or whatever that he we don't know what he thinks about it but it can't be all positive if he's like you know going in these kinds of adventures Right. Um, uh, he, you know, he, he clearly, uh, 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 by the end of the sexual encounter, he is talking to Mia as if she is yet another sexual con conquest. So, you know, to the extent that he's a, a male, right, and he's a, a predatory and all of that, those motivations seem kind of kind of clear to me, right? Yeah, and it's um, also nice that he doesn't like you're not clear if he's regretful because he genuinely thinks he did wrong by this girl or because like this was probably an illegal thing and something that he could be like reported to the cops over having done, you know, it yeah. doesn't, it, do, it doesn't exactly let you know what his, like from whence his regret is really coming, which is like the, the, the overall ambiguity of the character is nice. Yeah. All right. So this was movie macro number three. This would be like a good segue to, uh, when we talk about, uh, on the, on the patron only bonus show, Coming right up after this, um, we're going to be talking about, like I said earlier, Jordan B. Peterson. And I, I mean, I could just imagine him watching this movie. And like all these types, right, they just take pure like ideology out of it. Like when, when Elon Musk discusses what's wrong with Netflix, he, is, he is automatically goes to like the wokeism of Netflix as if like, I mean, that's one of the problems, right? But I mean, th that's like problem what? Number like 50 out of like a, a, a huge list, yeah. right? Where... Um, it's everything from, you know, just lowest common denominator of programming to just like outright stupidity to like, I mean, whatever, like it's just, there's no reason for a lot of this stuff to exist. And Peterson, you know, he'd watch something like this and, and he would r remind the audience, right? Like, guys, remember, sex is dangerous, right? Sex is something to fear, right? Yeah. Sex comes under all these circumstances, right? So we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about some of that. Dangerous harlots are trying to trap men into statutory rape and other pro and, yeah. and other kinds of behaviors you know you see she was putting on makeup in the movie yeah exactly that's you see what the, you see why these women put on that makeup they want to trap you that, yeah that, be, yeah she 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 she, 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 she came downstairs uh, shared his vodka and put on a little dance for him we, we all know what she was thinking right yeah. um so yeah so if you guys want the bonus show if you want to get all this really controversial discussion Right. You do two things. First, you hit like, you hit subscribe, right, for me to even want to allow you to become a patron, right? If you guys get out of line, if I see a patron getting out of line, I'm just going to kick you off my Patreon and you won't get shit from me anymore. Um, so just keep that in mind, guys. But if you do want it, right, second thing is you go to patreon.com slash automachination. You sign up. You get all the back bonus content, right? You get all the stuff going forward, and you get what's coming up right now. 
thank you for uh, sticking through with us, and we'll see the patrons very soon.